Good morning. Today we're picking back up with transportation planning and we're going to go through mode choice and trip assignment today. So a couple new topics and before we did trip generation and trip distribution and the book uh, did it kind of connect mode choice with uh, trip distribution and combine them into a single function. This is more the traditional model where we split mode choice out. So we're going to talk about it a little more in depth by itself today. All right, so this is where we've, where we've been and where we're going, I guess. We've been through generation, which is how many trips are being generated. And that's depending on uh, what the purpose of the trip is and what the characteristics of the zone are. Either you're coming from or going to. Trip distribution then looks at if you've got so many productions in one zone, basically residential apartments maybe, or, or homes, people living there, and then you have attractions in a different zone, how many people from one, the production zone are going to go to the attraction zone and so we we match we match those up and we call them uh, origin destination pairs or productions and attractions or uh, and tables and so forth and we looked at some of those before so that was trip distribution all right for that the the next step is how are you going to get there you want to go from your house and you want to go shopping are you going to ride your bike are you going to walk are you going to take a car are you going to take transit? Are you going to use ride chair? That's mode choice. And so what mode of transportation are you going to use to get there? And it's it's heavily dependent on what you have available to you. So if you don't own a car, you're going to take transit, right? That's you know, more likely you're going to take transit or a ride chair or walk if it's close enough, right? Uh, distance is going to be a big issue in, in mode choice again. So you're not going to walk if it's five miles away, probably, uh, unless you're really into uh, physical activity, want <laughs> to get some exercise right, for that. And so that's that's where we're at today. We, we have, we're starting off with mode choice for that. And our you know modes can be a lot of things. It can be car, it can be transit, walking, biking, ride share. All those are our mode choices. We typically don't model all of those in, in larger models because that adds so much extra complexity to the model and takes a lot more uh, computing time and, and so forth. All right, for that. So what we usually break it down into is these are our three most common uh, modes. And so the larger models, uh, the Northwest Indiana Regional Plan Commission's model, they break it down in these three uh, modes. And this is pretty common. It's pretty standard across the, the um, uh, all the different, I guess, uh, fields that, that work in, in transportation modeling. These are our common ones. So we have auto, we have transit, we have non-motorized, which is combining, you know, bike and and walking uh, for that. Rideshare is kind of a weird one now in that, um, you know, the car comes to your house and will take you to your destination. So it, it works like an auto trip, but yet you don't own it. So it's a little bit more like transit. So it's, uh, I don't know how we're modeling right here right now. I think that's a big area of research at the moment, right? It's a pretty new thing. It's probably going to look like an auto trip because that car is going from your location to where you're going, right? And it's not following a specified route, which is what we how we usually model transit. And it's not following a special schedule, which is also how we model, model transit uh, for that. Is uh, It's usually by routes and by schedules. So it's probably going to look more like an auto trip, but yet, the more trips will be generated if you know you have access uh, to a ride share. If you don't own a car, um, it's more likely you're going to make a trip if you know you can, you know, ride share is convenient. Right. So it's probably going to be a bigger effect on the number of trips generated than it is on which mode you're going to use. So that's, that's just my ramblings on, on how ride share may affect uh, these uh, the traditional model that, that we're looking at. Well, let's go back to the traditional model. Mode choice is usually a logit model. That's what we're almost always going to use for that. That's the most common uh, way for that. And we've already talked about logit before, right? And so we've got, it's a utility, and we calculate what's the utility of this mode, right? I can walk five miles, but the utility is going to be pretty low <laughs> for me to walk five miles, right? The funny thing is, you know, if you go uh, camping or something you, know, you like to walk five miles but on a normal day if I want to go over to the grocery store and get food I don't want to walk five miles and then how am I going to haul that home right so my utility for walking on that kind of a trip is going to be very low whereas driving my personal vehicle there is probably going to have a very high utility especially if I have stuff to bring back with me right so we calculate for each option you have for whichever trip you're going to make we look at all the utilities of each of those kinds of travel functions and that's what we're we're looking at 
uh, for that, right? And this is that logit model. We saw this before. This is exactly uh, the same logit model we've had before. And and we're just going to, for whatever, in this case, we're just doing mode choice, right? We're going to calculate the utilities uh, of those um, trips. Sorry. Let's do this. Okay. The, um, so this is our, our utility of a certain trip divided by the sum of the utilities, uh, e to the power of those utilities, of all the other trips, right? So that's, that's how we calculate this, this probability that you're going to make that choice, right? And so whichever you, you know, there's a certain probability for each trip, each type of uh, choice you've got, and you can calculate those probabilities. We went through that example last time using the logit model. And you can do a combined mode choice with uh, trip assignment model uh, and use logit that kind of combines them both together. This is the more traditional method where we're going to split mode choice out by itself and have its own logit model for it and its own probabilities uh, for that. So the and what basically we're saying is, uh, well, I sorry I said that. It's the it's a probability of that that trip divided by all the others, right? For that, and we find that out from travel surveys. We ask people how likely are you to walk to the grocery store, and it's going to be fairly low, right? Unless you're very close and you don't need much, right? For that, let me work through it. So that's mode choice. We'll go through that. We calculate those utilities of of all of the modes available to you. What are the what's the probability you're going to take one over the other, right? Um, in suburban the U.S., the the utility of driving your personal vehicle somewhere is going to be pretty high if you have a car available, right? For that, now you think about before you had your driver's license, what was the what was your utility functions, right? If you wanted to go somewhere, it's more likely you're going to ride your bike or walk, right? And we see that with the uh, um, the tweens are out on the street walking around more, right? Well, once they get their license, that usually ends. They don't walk that often to go see their buddies uh, or whatever you're going to drive. If you've got a car available now, if your folks have the cars and you don't have none available, yeah, you might still ride your bike somewhere. But, you know, you, you, know, you see 13 and 14 year olds riding their bikes around and we're going to school and, and stuff. That drops off pretty fast once they get their license. So that's uh, an example of how availability affects mode choice right, for that. Our last piece on this is trip assignment, right? So now we know how many people are going to be making trips. We know where they want to go. And we, we know what method they're going to use to get there. Now what path are they going to take? And that could be, for a car, it's pretty easy. You know, it's what road you're going to use to get there. For transit, it's what bus line may you ride. Or if you've got a choice between, like if you're in Chicago, you can ride the CTA or you could take a, uh, the train or you could ride the bus. You may have, you know, options there even within the transit mode. So that's what assignment comes down to is exactly what route you're taking. Uh, for that. And, uh, and for this assignment, we're, again, we're going to look at exactly what we had before for mode choice, non-motorized transit and automobile. For that, we're going to look at automobile because it, the same concepts work for all these, uh, these modes, but automobile is the, you know, 80-90% of our trips are made in a personal automobile. That's just the way the U.S. is at this point. And well, Valpo, it's probably 95%, right? The uh, so that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on what the auto trips are. And you can apply these same principles to the other modes as well as you go through that. All right. So the the volume of vehicles. So this is what we want to get down to. We want to know how many vehicles are on a certain route. And that's what we, we want to get to. Right. That That volume of vehicles is a function of the number of trips going between one zone to another, from zone I to zone J, times the probability of using a certain mode uh, within that, or a certain path. Uh, this is our path assignment and by mode for that. All right, so we know what's the probability you're going to use a certain road times the total number of trips, and that's going to equal the, the volume on that uh, route for that. And that's how we basically do trip assignment. That's what the background of this trip assignment is. If we have three routes, we have three different probabilities of people using those routes, that should all equal one if you added those three probabilities together. Because that's, if that's the only three routes that we have in the model, uh, all the trips have to be assigned to one of those routes. So the probability has to equal one if you added those three probabilities together times that an individual uh, 
probability times the total number of trips would equal that volume. Again, if you added all those volumes all together, they have to equal, right? And that's the it's conservation of trips. You know, we can't lose trips or generate uh, extraneous trips, right, within the model, within the boundaries of the model uh, for that. So that has to sum up and equal. This, the sum of all these trips is from the tri trip distribution uh, uh, section, right? It was from that. Uh, that piece of the four-step model. This is coming out of trip distribution, right? And then we've got these probabilities, which is what we're talking about now. And then we're going to finally assign them, right? So here is from an example we had before. We had these these three zones, just arbitrarily made, right? And I want to go from zone one to zone three. And, uh, we have this many productions in zone one. These are students at Valparaiso University, and they want to go over here shopping. Uh, so that's it over here. In zone three, how are they? How many trips are we going to have? Well, according to our gravity model, we had about 443 trips going from TAS one to TAS three, right? Trip assignment now says, how are we getting those trips from one to three? What's our route from one over here to three? And and <clears throat> and so first thing is, in your model, you have to build the network. So you say, well, here are our possible routes. All right. So here I've got this route. I'm going to go up here to Lincoln Way. Going to, or, um, yeah, I guess it's Lincoln, starts at Lincoln Way, becomes Laporte, and I come over here in State Road 2 then, and then come in here to Meyer. All right. The second route takes U.S. 30 to 49 and then gets off on 2 and goes there. And Route 1, you're going to follow U.S. 30 all the way over here by the airport and take that little windy road, Eastport Center or whatever it's called, and get there. All right, so we've got three viable routes. You can think of some variations on that, right? I'm sure you could think of, well, I'm going to take Sturdy or I'm going to take Sylhavy and then across, right? So just for our purposes, let's just look at three. We're going to look at these three routes. And, and a lot of times in these models, we don't model all the little roads. We almost never model all the little roads. We're going to model the major routes and we're connecting the, the centroids of these zones. So the center of of one to the center of three that's how the models work right and so now we're going to look at how many trips are on each one of those three routes and we're again saying to ourselves we only have three routes so trip assignment is going to say this that 70 percent of the trips right our probability of using this route was 0.7 so we take 0.7 times 443 we get 310 trips we take 20 percent times 443 we should get 89 and 10 percent that right and these are arbitrary numbers i picked for what these percentages could be but you can see this is a pretty uh long slow route not very many people are going to use that but maybe they really hate going through the new roundabout at Silhavy and laporte so they people might right some people say well then there's stoplights in here and it's kind of congested i don't like that road it's easier for me to jump on the 30 hit 49 and come up here and then most people are probably going to go the most direct route through that. And these are all assumptions, right? I'm not saying that it's exactly how, you know, which routes people are going to take from the centroid of one to the centroid of three. It's just a guess, right? So we've got three routes and we're assigning some probability to people using those routes uh, for that getting from zone one to three. And one way to think about this is you've got these choices, right? So it's like if you go to the grocery store and you see all these checkout lines, right? And you know this game, right? You've got your, your cart and you're like, well, I want to get checked out and which line am I going to get into, right? So which, which line are you going to pick? Right? And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm checking out everybody's cart. I'm like, well, she doesn't have much, although she is driving backwards uh, with her cart. So that's weird. So she's probably going to do something complicated up here at the checkout line. Check out this cart over here. Right? Oh, that thing is loaded. That is going to take a long time to check out. She has coupons, too. Right? I'm not getting behind her. So I'm going to look for the, uh, the line that's the shortest usually, but then I'm also checking out what's in the cart, right? So it's, it's capacity. What's the capacity of these lines? What I'm always looking for is what's the fastest, right? Isn't that what we want? We want to get out of there as fast as possible, All right? For that. And that's, that's usually what we're going to choose. And the, um, and, and this is something you, I think, intuitively do when you go to the checkout is you're checking out the line. It's a little hard to tell just exactly how long each of these lines is, and that's always a problem, too, right? The other things I look for, are there kids? Mm, that slows things down. And, you know, if they're over 60, they probably have coupons they're going to write a check. So I'm not going to get behind older people if I can help it. Unless they have 
very few items, right? So anyway, that's my reasoning. Like apparently this is our virtual cot shopping cart. We did a pretty good job here, although we're really sloppy on how we loaded stuff in our cart. So we're not very organized. If I give ourselves a minus two on that, we'd be a slow one to be behind in the in the checkout line. So it's, this is our game, right? So this is like we have 22 routes, apparently. Which route are you going to get into? And you're going to analyze this by what's my fastest route. And that's exactly what we do with our modeling is, is we do in the same thing. With trip assignment is the computer, in this case, is going to model these things, kind of like checkout lines, and say what's our fastest route uh, for that. And we're going to assign trips to each of these routes just like we assign people and their carts to each of these checkout lines, right? So we're assigning trips to these routes as we go through that. Now, if if we assign um, two more people to this line because it's the fastest, right? And these people are moving through pretty quick. Um, yeah, the cashier also makes a difference, right? How fast the cashier is. Sometimes I watch the cashiers a little bit to get a feel for, ooh, that one looks slow or ooh, this one's really moving, right? But anyway, um, and Costco does a really good job of keeping theirs pretty well trained and are all about equal. Anyway, so if we assign two more people to hear well it was the fastest route it's not the fastest anymore and that's exactly how the computer models do this too is they assign trips to routes until they and it's based on what's the fastest path right you're going to want to go the fastest shortest travel time from one to three if we assign a bunch of people to this route through here right the 70 percent route on link on the port the that's no that'll be if we assign too many, it's no longer the fastest path. Oh, now this becomes the fastest, right? So we start assigning more trips to this. Ooh, now it's not fast anymore, and this becomes the fastest. Okay, if we assign some to that. It's naturally a longer route. It's naturally going to take longer to use it, so we fewer people are going to take that, right? And it doesn't have maybe natural capacity. There's a lot of capacity on this US 30 to 49 and then off, right? Because that's four-lane road all the way through. There's a lot of capacity there. Laporte's going to feel capacity constraints faster because it's two-lane and a lot of it uh, through that section, right? And, it, and that's what uh, we kind of can see and that back to our grocery store model is what's the capacity of the lane? Some checkout people are faster. That's a higher capacity, right? But if it's a longer line, then the travel times are going to be slower, right? And and I do, personally, I do a really terrible job in checkout lines, despite all of my discussion about how I pick a line. I still do a bad job because it always seems like I'm in the slowest one. I don't know if you ever feel that way. Well, our computer model has uh, complete knowledge of the network because it's assigning these routes, Right, so it's going to do a better job, and it's going to assign people on these routes until they equal, uh, reach an equilibrium, and they're all about uh, as fast as each other right, for that. And that's one of the basics of of our trip assignment through that. And the book, these are a couple of graphs from the book. Right, you can say, well, it's is it a linear relationship? Right, here's my free flow travel time. Right, it's not zero because I have to go some distance and I can't go an infinite speed. So there is some travel time to start with, and then as traffic flow increases, my travel time goes up. Right, capacity gets restricted, and then my travel time doesn't go up. All right, so that's the, a linear relationship. The book talks about it. It's not realistic. No, I just to let you know, it's not realistic, right, for that. Um, it's easy to model, though, and that's one of the reasons we sometimes we use that. But if you remember this graph from back in Chapter 5 in our traffic flow piece, right, here's speed versus flow. Uh, this is one of those three parts of that uh, Green Shields model. Right? At a high speed, we can have very low flow, but as our flow increases, we start here, say high speed, as flow increases our speed drops and then we actually become unstable and our speed gets even lower and our flow starts dropping All right for that we actually follow the the curve of this graph around this direction let's just look at this piece though as speed increases um, our flow drops and drops and drops and and or if you look at it this way, as flow increases, we're moving this direction. As flow increases, our speed is dropping, dropping, and it's not it's not a linear relationship, right? It's an exponential relationship, and it drops like that. So that's what this graph is showing as as our flow increases that travel time, because our speed is dropping, our travel time is going up, and it, it approaches the capacity asymptotically like this. And this is a this is generally what what roads exhibit, right? This is how roads exhibit uh, flow versus travel time relationship. As you get more people using it, your travel time goes up, right? For that, and it's it's not um, a linear 
it's it's uh, asymptotic for that. It's just based on you know how cars interact with each other. So it's a nonlinear, and this would be a, a normal graph of of how we get that. And what the computer model is going to do is it's going to assign cars to each of these routes, and it's going to iterate through them. And so it assigns some, and it says, oh, well, this, this route is really slowing down. I'm going to assign some more over here to this route. Oh, now it's slowing down. And I'm going to assign some to that third route, and it starts to slow down. And it just keeps iterating through that until it reaches equilibrium. And basically every route is going to take the same amount of time. And this is one way to state that, is the travel time between the specified origin and destination on all possible routes for that is the same or equal to the travel time experienced by a traveler on any unused route. So there's no other route that's faster. We're going to assign the, the trips needed to each of these routes until they all equal the same travel time right, for that. And here's an example, again, out of the book. They use route one as a linear, which is not realistic, a linear route, um, so a travel time relationship. Route two is a nonlinear relationship right, for that. And... Uh, route one is probably longer, right? It's starting at a higher travel time when there's zero traffic flow on it. So it must be a longer route or it has a much lower speed limit. It could be, this is a surface street. This is a freeway or something, All right? So you can make up your own, <laughs> your own example for, for which routes that could be. This one is just naturally going to take longer, even with zero flow on it. And we find out, okay, well, this one's faster. Uh, the number one decision point for people about how to travel is travel time. Right? Why do you fly and not drive to California? It's travel time. Right? You don't want to spend that many days on the road. Why do you? Um, why would you even fly to? Uh, well, why would you drive to Chicago and not take the train? Right? It's, it's probably travel time would be your number one reason uh, for that is because it's, you can usually get there faster on your own. Now you have to deal with parking. There's other external things that you may want to take into account, but it's going to take extra time to go to the South Shore Station, jump on the train, and then get to Chicago. Now, if you don't have a vehicle available, but you do have, you can ride the shuttle bus up to the South Shore and then ride a train, that would be a reason to take that. All right, that'd be a that's a mode choice option because because car personal car is not available to you right for that, but typically people choose choose travel based on travel time right and that's um, that's why you know you probably aren't gonna fly to Indianapolis right because you don't want to go to I don't know where the nearest regional airport is South Bend or I don't know if Gary has flights anymore. <laughs> From, but, you know, you're not going to go to Midway and then get a plane down in Indianapolis, right? That's going to be a really long travel time. If you've got a car available, you're going to drive. And even though you may prefer flying in general, um, the travel time is what's going to probably push your mode choice. And that's what people usually choose. So we're going to choose, uh, starting off with, we're going to choose this Route 2 because it's always going to be faster until it gets up to this amount of flow. At this amount of flow, now they're equal. And now if we moved up here, um, as, we, as we move forward, the computer will continue adding cars on the Route 2, but it's also going to start adding you know, some on the Route 1 as well. And maybe not, it won't be equal because this one's not linear for that. But as it, as it goes forward, it, it signs uh, trips to both routes until their travel time is equal. So at any one point you stop... <coughs> You can just draw a horizontal line across here, and that's that should be this route will have that many vehicles, and this route will have that many vehicles, but they both have the same travel time. And that's what we that's our equilibrium is we're assigning uh, vehicles as we go, and so we have this this equilibrium in travel time uh, for that. And so there is no route faster than the other. Now, when it starts off, route two is always faster, so all the vehicles are being assigned to route two. Again, this is that iterative approach that they take. You know, when the, inside these computer models and it moves forward All right well what's the curve of this thing look like what's how affected by by traffic is travel time how do we model that oh well luckily for us uh, the Bureau of Public Roads which no longer exists um, they came up with these these calculations they did empirical studies they, they measured these things for different types of roads and these are this is the equation they came up with so our our travel time is equal to the initial travel time times some factor. Here is some factor. Some factor is is 
dependent on the volume to capacity ratio. We, you know, we've seen that a lot of times, right? In traffic signals, everything else. We love the volume to capacity ratio. So we take that volume to capacity ratio for the road. This is how many cars are actually on the road. This is the capacity of that road, standard capacity of that road. And we raise it to some power beta, and then we multiply it times alpha, add one to it, and that's our factor of multiplying the orig original travel time. If this was 10 minutes, we're going to take 10 minutes times some factor, and that's our new travel time. And then uh, from their studies, this is what they found. Here is our alpha, and here's our beta coefficients that plug into this equation right, for that. And, we've, and it's different by freeways and by what the standard... Um, free flow speed is, right? So here's, we've learned all about free flow speeds, right? It's coming back at us. Uh, this is multi-lane highways. It's not well-defined as it says down here, but it's generally not a freeway, but it has more than a single lane in each direction, right? And so here's freeways, here's multi-lane highways for that and for whatever that free flow speed is. You can see we have very different alpha beta factors based on the kind of facility, facility that it is, right? For that. And you can see that at 70 mile per hour freeway, a freeway that is normally uh, the free flow speed is 70 miles per hour. So that free flow speed is what we get this initial travel time out of, right? So a 70 mile per hour free flow speed, okay, that sounds great, right? But it's super sensitive to this volume to capacity ratio. Look how big this coefficient is, this beta. That is huge, 9.8, right? That thing is going to blow up. If you get over one, which we do, uh, you get over a, a 1.0 volume to capacity ratio, this thing is just going to explode, right? Look at a multi-lane highway is much more, or is less sensitive to that. It's less sensitive. It's only a 5.4 factor, right? Now it's got a little bit higher alpha factor. That's not as big a deal as having this, this beta here. This is that exponentiality. This is how asymptotic this becomes as, as flow hits it. Right. Freeways are, are super sensitive to the volume and capacity ratio. They break down. If this was your initial free flow speed right on a freeway, multi-lane highway is a little more forgiving because I honestly, there's already stoplights and stuff along a multi-lane highway and it's a, more of an expressway experience to start with. So it's a little more forgiving on that. This is how I interpret these numbers. Right. So keep that in mind. And that's and these have been kind of, you know, it's from 1985 highway capacity manual. These are time-tested <laughs> numbers. We still use them. All right, how's that? So here's a, a four-lane, here's an example. All right, we had a four-lane expressway, which is, a, is that a freeway or a multi-lane? Mm -hmm. That's a multi-lane. Expressway is a multi-lane. It's not a freeway. So we've got two lanes in each direction. We've got a free flow speed of 60. So here's our free flow speed range, right? 60 miles per hour. The travel time is 15 minutes. Uh, so whatever... Uh, 60 miles per hour in 50 minute in 15 minutes, right? So that's uh, one quarter of 60. So that's what 15 miles. Yep. So it'd be 15 miles away. 60 miles per hour is 15 minutes. Okay, mile a minute. Assume uh, normal flow capacity is 1,200 vehicles per hour per lane. That's what this is. 60 miles per hour. This is what we're feeling comfortable with. 1,200 vehicles per hour. That's capacity. So we're gonna plug that in there. During the peak hour, we have 3,000 vehicles are expected to travel from A to B. What's the adjusted travel time? Hmm. Okay. So we've got 3,000 total vehicles being assigned. What's our adjusted capacity? So let's let's pick out our coefficients first. Multi-lane highway, 60 miles per hour. Alpha is 0.83. Beta, 2.7. Awesome. Now, our initial travel time is 15 minutes. They told us that. Great. Our volume of vehicles on this route is 3,000 vehicles per hour. Our capacity per lane is 1,200. We have two lanes going in that direction. Our capacity is 2,400. Okay, so our V over C is 3,000 divided by 2,400. Right, greater than 1. We can plug that in. Here we were plugging into the equation. Here's the initial equation. 15 minutes, 1 plus. Here's the alpha, and here is our beta that we picked out of there. All right? You work through all that. It used to take you 15 minutes when everything was flowing nice, right? It now takes you 37.7 minutes, right? If you live in an urban setting, this is not uncommon. This is not at uncommon at all. It's going to take you more than twice as long to get somewhere when you're at the peak time. Uh, during a commuting session, right? And if we were to take that, right, that was 15 miles, we figured out. That brings you back down to an average speed of about 23.9 miles per hour. Right? You went from 60 miles per hour, average speed down to 23.9. <clears throat> so this is how uh, trip assignment would work on a single route, 
Now you work from a single route and you look at that route <clears throat> and add capacity onto it until you reach this travel time. Now, if we had two other routes um, and it could be uh, surface streets, it could be a freeway, they would, as we assign trips to it, the computer is going to model that trip, remodel and find out it's going to calculate the new travel time. It's going to do that for all three possible routes. If that's the total number we had. And it's going to keep, it'll sign more traffic, this V. Right? It's going to keep assigning that traffic until the travel time on this route equals the travel time on the other two routes. If one of them is a little bit faster, it's going to assign some more uh, vehicles over to that route. Right? It does this iteratively, works through this until it reaches equilibrium, which is defined as all of these travel times are the same. And in... In practice, they're not exactly the same. They're within a certain tolerance. And so you assign trips until you're within, I don't, you set the tolerance when you run these models. So it's within 1% of each other or within um, a half percent, right, for that. The The difference is, is that it, the tighter that tolerance you want, the, the, diff, the lower that difference, it takes a lot more flops of the computer running through it. It takes a lot more uh, iterations for the computer to run through. It may take 10,000 iterations to come to equilibrium on a larger model, right? It may take 20,000, I'm not. And, but if you set that tolerance at 5%, it's going to take fewer and it's going to run much faster and you're going to get results a lot faster, right? And so that's why we, we have some tolerance on there. Theoretically, we reach equilibrium. Well, we get close enough, right? And we set how close we're willing to accept on that. And so every every route between those that origin destination is going to be at 37.7 minutes plus or minus, you know, a percent or so for that. And that's that's how trip assignment works in practice. 